All right, hello everyone and welcome. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started because um, we do have some good content to cover today. Um, so welcome to today's webinar um, presented by Centauri Health Solutions. Um, today we're gonna be going over EDPS, the Next Frontier Supplemental Service Services Submission. Uh, before I turn it over to our presenter, um, I do wanna go over just a few housekeeping items. Perfect. So um, everyone's uh, video is going to be off and mic is off. So if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, we do just ask that you drop them into the panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, our presenter will answer all questions at the end of the presentation. Um, just note that any of the questions that are unable to get to, they will follow up with you after the webinar. Um, something to note as well is that you will get access to the presentation as well as the recording um, the following day. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dawn to get us started. Very good. Thank you, Bailey. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And what would a Star Trek-themed presentation be if I didn't say EDPS, the final, the final frontier? These are the voyages of the Starship CMS. So there's our... Our formal intro, but I should more formally introduce our learning objectives today. And in brief, we're going to do an in-depth overview of CMS requirements for the submission of supplemental benefit data. We're going to do a high-level overview of the operational and technical implementation plan for the changes. And then we're going to do an overview of some new post-production benchmarking and reporting that you might want to consider to support these submissions. So without further ado, let's kind of launch it to our content here. Uh, we have a lot to cover today, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have some time at the end for some good discussion and some Q&A. But if not, be rest assured that we will be following up with anyone's questions that we don't get to. So I thought it might be a good idea to start with some history, because with something like this, it's really good to understand, you know, why this change is, is coming at this time. And of course, um, a lot of us might have been around back in on that fateful day in October of 2010, when CMS announced that Encounter Data was coming in terms of it being submitted on an 837 professional or institutional, transitioning from the five data element wraps format. And so that was a long time ago. And of course, submissions commenced in 2012. That's when EDPS officially started. And at that time, you know, CMS had the authority to require all encounter data for every benefit provided to an enrollee, inclusive of supplemental benefits. And at that time, there were about 47 different benefits that fell under the umbrella of supplemental benefits. And these were benefits that Medicare Advantage organizations could offer that were not covered by traditional Medicare. So these were things like your dental, your vision, your hearing, you know, things like that. Over time, you can see that the number of supplemental benefits that MAOs were allowed to offer expanded. And this happened with different legislation over the years, like the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. Um, and this is actually what allowed the General Accountability Office to review what kinds of supplemental benefits that health plans were offering. And of course, the General Accountability Office is kind of the watchdog of the government, similar to what we have the OIG, the Office of the Inspector General, who's the watchdog for, you know, health plans, providers. We've got the General Accountability Office, which is the watchdog over the government. Government. And so that's kind of what oversees CMS and the policies that they, they're promulgating. So that's who the GAO is. So at that time, they said, you know, we need to have the authority to review these benefits over time. So you can see also over time, benefits were expanded. Like in 2019, you know, five more benefit categories were added that were called primarily health-related supplemental benefits. And so these were just saying, you know, kind of expanding the type of, of benefits that could be offered to beneficiaries. And they were, these are ones that are intended to reduce avoidable healthcare utilization, such as in-home support services. Now, later on, MAOs were allowed to include benefits that offered, quote, a reasonable expectation of improving or maintaining the health or function of chronically ill enrollees, such as food, produce, meals, and things of that nature. So that came along later with supplemental benefits for the chronically ill. And they were primarily, of course, intended to address social determinants of health 
and these other things that will improve or maintain health. So along comes 2023, and this is where the GAO made good on their 2018 Bipartisan Budget Act provision to review supplemental benefits. Now, of course, over time, a lot of you probably are aware the GAO would periodically review the status of encounter data with CMS to say, is it complete? Is it accurate? Are you achieving your goals with it? And so with this report, the 23-105527 in 2023, they, they did an analysis. And so back in 22, they analyzed plan benefit data for 3,893 MAOs with a collective 16.89 million enrollees. So that's a good, nice, big sample size. And that's about two thirds of the enrollees and, and non-employer MA plans in the United States. They also interviewed officials from CMS and six at Medicare Advantage organizations. And so the results of that review are in that report. And if anybody would like to see it, you can certainly email me and I can send it to you, although it's available out at the GAO's website. And they concluded two things in this report. First, that CMS wasn't requiring the MAOs to support to, or to submit supplemental benefits data. And second, there were various challenges inherent in submitting in the EDPS data format, which is the 837, related to this, such as lack of appropriate procedure codes for things such as food and produce. And in their report, the GAO recommended that CMS further clarify the guidance related to the reporting of supplemental benefits data and that they should take steps to address identified challenges in data format and content like procedure codes and diagnosis codes. And CMS did that. And we saw that in the recent requirements released in February 2024. And those are the topics of our discussion today. So I included this slide just so you could see kind of another visualization of supplemental benefits evolution. And it, of course, started quite some time ago um, with primarily health-related supplemental benefits. Then they expanded to a broader array, such as transportation, meal delivery, adult daycare, and then also other benefits such as pest control. And then there are also the ability to offer disease-tailored benefit designs, including lower cost sharing for certain services and or, or uh, certain other benefits. And then, you know, CMS is also testing flexibility in the benefit offerings for the chronically ill, such as targeting benefits and lower cost sharing, including for drugs. So there's a lot of innovation going on behind the scenes, and CMS needs this data to kind of see what kinds of benefits are being offered, what their costs are, and what their utilization is. So as a refresher, supplemental benefits are financed by MAOs one of two ways, via a rebate from CMS if an MAO's projected costs to provide benefits equivalent to a traditional Medicare A and B, are below CMS's bidding target for the MAO's locality or via a premium. Now, according to the GAO's 2023 study, over 83% of MAOs finance the benefits solely with rebates. Now, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, payments to MAOs for these benefits have increased rapidly over the years, raising questions about how these dollars are being used. And we know that because CMS is concerned about that and is why they want this data. In the last five years, these payments, also referred to as rebates, have more than doubled, rising from $1,140 per enrollee in 2018 to $2,350 per enrollee in 2023. In total, that is over $70 billion in one year alone. Now, the offering of these benefits is one way that MAOs differentiate themselves from their competitors and are, they're very attractive to beneficiaries. And I can tell you with absolute certainty based on my own parents, and you see one of them here celebrating his 75th birthday and other seniors in my family and networks that offering these benefits makes a difference in their choice to enroll in Medicare Advantage as opposed to traditional Medicare, and also makes a difference in the MAO that they ultimately choose. So, talking about why, why, why do we have to do this and why now? Well, it's, it's not as simple as because I said so, although some might say you know, the GAO said so and says that little is known about supplemental benefit utilization. There's a lot of reasons why they want this. And so here you can also see a visual of some of the most commonly offered benefits. We have vision, hearing, 
in-home support services, support for caregivers of enrollees, food and produce, and meals beyond a limited basis. So basically, the GAO wants to make sure that U.S. taxpayers are getting what they pay for, so to speak. And if they aren't, or what is being paid for is not tied to better health outcomes in a cost-effective manner, you want to make sure that that data is available so they can know that and so that the data is available for decision making for CMS and other entities regarding these benefits. They want to primarily distinguish between items and services that are covered under Medicare Part A and Part B and supplemental benefits. They want to understand the use and value of supplemental benefits and Medicare Advantage for the benefit of future policy making. So they want to see who's using these things and what they're using them for. They want to ensure that what is being provided as supplemental benefits is consistent with the plan bid. It's very important. And also health equity and social determinants of health. That's top of mind for everybody these days. We want to ensure that the supplemental benefits also support enrollees' health and their social needs. CMS also, in their February HPMS memo, <clears throat> announced some new initiatives related to this data that they intend to pursue. And they want to examine the value of the benefits being provided in accordance with the GAO recommendations, and they need data in order to accomplish them. And so they have a new requirement to report expenditures for various categories of these benefits through the medical loss ratio reports. They also recently finalized an information collection request on data elements related to supplemental benefits cost and utilization among Part C enrollees. And they also have a proposed information collection requests to improve plan benefit package categorization of supplemental dental services. Again, great deal of innovation and um, attention being paid to this. So let's now take a look at their instructions on providing that data. And after that, we'll take a look at a high level plan for operationalizing these instructions, because I know that's what you're here for. Okay, so a word about CMS monitoring. Um, CMS has always been really good to, about responding to questions and concerns when they require a new process. So if you're having difficulty or, you know, or anticipate any roadblocks, be sure that you reach out to them. You know, they're always really good when they, they publish instructions and new procedures to have resources on hand to answer questions. And there is a risk adjustment mailbox for that purpose. And I actually have that at the end of the presentation if that's needed. So. Our general instructions for these submissions, and you see here that I've got a SNP from cssoperations.com, which of course is where CMS houses anything that you'd ever want to know about encounter data submission and risk adjustment from an operational perspective. Policy guidance, of course, is, is housed at the CMS website, but CMS, CSSC Ops is where you'll find everything you need to know about operations, including their submissions processing guide. And they did publish a guide that is very specific for supplemental services submission, and they're going to incorporate that eventually into the main guide. But for now, it has its own guide, and it has two appendices, and we're going to talk about what these contain in this presentation. So... They are starting with this at any of these these benefits that we've been talking about that are provided with dates of service beginning 1-1 of 2024, so the beginning of this year, and they want this to commence as soon as possible. So they didn't give like a hard date, like you need to be able to do this by July 1st. It's as soon as you can start submitting it, do so. And catch-up submissions should be completed by 12-31-2024. So going back retroactively to 1-1 of 2024, but they want you to be wrapped up, giving you a whole year to be wrapped up. And of course, you know, contact them if this is going to be a problem so that they can work with you to make sure that this data gets submitted. And like we, I said, technical guidance is available at cssciops.com. And CMS plans to monitor submissions and reach out to MAOs that might not be submitting this data based on what they've bid. And they said the MA EDPS filtering logic for risk score calculation remains unchanged. So that's kind of their general guardrails for this. Now, a special word about dental, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, that has kind of a special timeline for submission. So now we're going to talk about that. So we'll start, of course, with dental submissions, like I said, because they've got some special, special circumstances here, and they are responsible for what is likely to be the most operationally impactful because their submission requires 
the use of a new data format um, from the X12837 institutional and professional. So it's going to require the submission of this data on an 837D, D for dental. And it's really not much different than an 837 professional. So don't panic. Don't panic too much. It's very similar to a professional transaction. It just includes information about the teeth surfaces, because when you report dental, they want to know what surfaces of the teeth are being worked on for some services. So Medicare covered dental services must continue to be submitted using the 837P for dental services that are Part B benefits or on the 837I for those that are Part A. So these we've been doing ever since the beginning of EDPS, and these are dental procedures that must be done under sedation in a medical facility. So these are perhaps for, for our seniors who have dementia or Alzheimer's and cannot sit in a dentist chair to have dental work done and they need to have some dental work or certain oral surgery procedures. Those are the types of things we're talking about. So not your routine cleanings and your routine x-rays and fillings and things of that nature. That's going to be the 837D that's going to start coming as soon as we can start getting it submitted. So for dental benefits, these are your things that are preventive and comprehensive dental services outside of Medicare. And so these are the ones that go on the 837D. And then there are some new requirements we're going to talk about that identify that particular encounter. It says, it says, hey, I'm a supplemental benefit as opposed to a regular encounter or a chart review. So these routine cleanings, x-rays, and fillings. And CMS has published some specific guidance on when these submissions start. So let's take a look at that. So CMS plans to notify submitters when the EDPS will begin accepting the 837D. And their, their ETA is June 2024 for this. And organizations with capitated or allowance arrangements must work with their vendors to populate a compliant 837D. So what this means is the, these vendors will not be authorized to submit directly to the EDPS on the plan's behalf. So in other words, you can't tell your dental vendor, send an 837D file directly to CMS. That's not allowed. So you've got to receive that data, be able to do the, the processing, the, the inbound processing to produce the outbound 837D and submit it to CMS. The vendor can't do it for you. Now, if you're using a submissions vendor, such as, for example, you know, any number of vendors out there might be doing EDPS submissions, they can do it for you. But of course, they've got to be able to receive the 837D, process it, and produce a compliant outbound file. And CMS, and CMS plans to produce a guide for this prior to June. They haven't specified yet what day that will be, but it will be prior to June. So another word about dental benefits is some health plans provide a lump sum allowance for beneficiaries to spend on any supplemental benefits that they might like. Um, like they might say, you know, here the, here's a $2,000 prepaid card that is to be used for whatever types of benefits that fall within that that umbrella that's allowed you know you you might be saying oh what do we do about that you know they're allowed to spend it cms has allowed for that and we're going to talk about what that looks like um in terms of the 837 and the breakdown but you do have to break it down by by spending category so the whole moral of that story with dental is, you know, CMS still expects an 837D if they've spent, say, 500 of that allowance on dental. CMS expects to see an 837D for that and then 837P and I for the rest of what they spent it on. So let's talk more, a little bit more about how that happens. So you might also be saying, wow, you know, CMS did acknowledge even to the GAO that one of the challenges related to collecting data on supplemental benefits is having the appropriate NPIs, because let's face it, you know, places like grocery stores where you're getting a food benefit, they don't have an NPI. So, so what do you do? Um, HICPIC and CPT codes that represent the type of thing that they're getting, again, like food. Food doesn't have a CPT code. So CMS had to account for this with certain diagnosis codes and revenue codes and other data to meaningfully identify them in a manner that also complies with the requirements of the 837. 
And you're actually going to see a sample 837 later on in the presentation. For those of you who are curious who have never seen one, a lot of you out there know that I speak, I live and breathe 837s. So of course there's going to be an 837. Um, now to address this challenge, they have specified a set of default data. Now they, as you, most of you know, if you're involved with encounter data processing, they have default data like default NPIs, default tax IDs for certain situations that deal with atypical providers that need to have that data. So a lot of you are probably already familiar with this concept. Now, this is how they are addressing that challenge where you know the GAO said, mm, there's a lot of data that doesn't really have codes. And so We've got a set of default data. And so also you can see, I have a little arrow here where you can see appendix C is where they they have that specified. And you're actually going to see a document that I, I um, that you'll see some of the population of this data um, in a matrix that I put together for requirements. And you can see an example of that. So um, CMS, of course, acknowledged that certain types of benefits don't produce the same, same types of data that are associated with a medical service and have different approaches to payment. And so their guidance in, in the main supplemental submission guide, they specify how to populate the encounter in these cases. And they have very several very specific examples. And these are your situations like your pre-funded payment cards for over-the-counter items and groceries, kind of that I mentioned earlier and payment for membership that allows access to services like a monthly gym membership fee or something else. And of course, again, just disclaimer, if there's a situation that you're like, oh, the, the guide doesn't address this and I'm not quite sure, get in contact with them and they'll be able to give you some guidance. And they also remind that all prior CMS requirements for default data still apply in addition to what is specified in Appendix C. Because as we know, we've been dealing with default data for quite some time in EDPS. So all of those rules still apply. Okay, so you've heard me talking about, you know, a supplemental benefits matrix. This is arguably the first and the most important step for successful implementation. So you've heard me talking, you know, for a while now about operationalizing this guidance. So now we're kind of going to get into the nuts and bolts of how to make this happen in a short period of time so that you can get those catch-up submissions done and be well on your way to success with submissions. So first, you have to identify exactly what qualifies as a supplemental benefit according to CMS guidance for each contract. So health plans out there that operate multiple contracts, you'll have to have a matrix for each contract and for actually and looking at their bid. And this is going to establish your use cases that are going to be, be need to be accounted for in testing and production. And it's useful to remind the industry, although a lot of you are probably aware of this, that CMS provides a testing environment. Um, the Tier 2 environment is designed for situations like this so that you can test prior to turning things on for production. There are some guardrails like you can't have more than 5,000 uh, records in a file and some other things, but there is a testing environment available. And I would guess that your organization also probably has a testing environment as well. So. After you've identified all your benefits and listed them out, and again, you'll see an example of this here very shortly, you're going to assign a supplemental benefit services category code, we call that an SBSC for short, from the 99 possible values in Appendix B to each identified benefit. So here you have my little, um, my little uh, arrow here for Appendix B out here on CSSC Ops and construct a matrix of these to facilitate development and testing and pay special attention to the examples of special cases that are in sections 2.12.3 and 2.12.4 to ensure all of the possible benefits are properly accounted for. Because if you don't, it's you're gonna have submissions issues and your data is gonna be incomplete and inaccurate. So you wanna be sure that you get all the services that are possibly being submitted, and the good source of those is your bid. So, now we're gonna talk about those combined benefits, like these prepaid benefit cards or lump sum payments or things that don't easily translate on a one-to-one -one basis. Now, CMS says combined benefits must be broken out into separate encounters by their supplemental benefit service code. 
And again, there's 99 of those. And this includes the situation where the beneficiary is given the lump sum to spend on whatever they like. Now, this could require working with your external vendors to provide appropriate claims information so that you have accurate descriptions of what's happening and that you can choose the correct code. Because a lot of times external vendors are providing these benefits. A good example would be Nations Benefits. Anybody who works with them, they're one of the more um, popular vendors that do this. So they're a good example of this. And if members submit reimbursement requests to the plan, ensure that those requests contain the data necessary to fully inform the encounter that's being submitted. Because a lot of times members have to submit receipts or other things to tell the plan what's been spent on. You want to be sure to account for that situation and ensure that you've got the basic information you need to populate an encounter. Now, You'll see three codes in Appendix B for other that are to be used for benefits that are not included in the appendix listing. And CMS, of course, will probably monitor the usage of these codes, sort of like they 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 put a disclaimer like, all right, you can use the atypical NPI, but we're going to be taking, you know, making sure that, you know, it's not being overused, right? That because it's very tempting to just throw the other code in there and not do the due diligence about what type of benefit it is, they're probably going to be watching that. So you want to make sure that if you've got a service that doesn't fall into one of the 99 categories, reach out to CMS and talk to them about it so that you make sure you've got an accurate code and you're not just putting it into other because there's really nothing else to do with it unless that's where it really belongs. There are also um, five SBSCs for the SSBCI related benefits. So any of those that your plan is offering that fall into that category, there are five specific codes that correlate to those. And then there are 11 SBSCs for dental related benefits that you use on the 837D. So they have it broken down you know, pretty well in their documentation. And like I said, there are 99 of these. So there's a good chance that you'll have them you know, a code for whatever you're offering, but if not, you know, work with them to identify an appropriate code if necessary, or you can use the other. So how is, how are we going to report this code? I've been talking about this SBSC, um, and now I'm going to go into 837 speak. So hopefully, you know, I'm not going to have eyes glaze over and, but, I, but I promise I tried to make this kind of as painless as possible. And you are going to see this in an, in a sample 837. So CMS has specified requirements for the 2400 line level PWK segment. And this is a segment that's used, it's called the paperwork segment since PWK, and it's used to report this kind of extra data. And so for those of you that speak 837, they're gonna use the PWK 01, 02, and 05. And then those are some stat, or static data element values that are to be used at the line level because there is a PWK segment that's at the header level. This is the line level because we want each line to reflect the proper code that's being referred to for a use case. Now, the PWK 06 is what changes. This is the value that's assigned for the benefit from that list of 99. Now, each line can contain only one occurrence of the SBSC, and it should be reported in the first iteration of the PWK segment, since you, we know it repeats, right? Now, also important to say, chart review records cannot contain an SBSC. So when you're writing your logic and doing your implementation, you might want to write yourself a little check because the PWK segment has specific values that indicate that something's a chart review. Those can't have these values. So you want to be sure that you're checking for that so you don't let data go through that's just going to reject it CMS. So our static values, the ones that go in the PWK 01, 02, and 05 are right here. And so these values will always go there. And then the PWK 06 is the dynamic value populated with the appropriate SBSC from Appendix B. And then they want you to put ZZ at the end of it. So an example they give in the guide is routine foot care. Here's your, your, stat, your three static values. And then ZF, I'm sorry, 7FZZ is what you would use to indicate routine foot care. And then for fluoride treatments, here are your three static values in your PWK. And then it gets a 16A3ZZ. That says 
I am a fluoride treatment and I am a supplemental benefit. So that's kind of like your big, your, your big, you know, basic change. And then of course, like I said, CMS made allowances for defaults. So now we're going to take a look at an example and I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing and then reshare. And hopefully um, everybody can see um, an Excel spreadsheet here. This is going to be an just a kind of a, an example that I put together of what a requirements matrix might look like that you need to provide to anybody who's doing the development on your 837s. Um, what I did was I used some of the examples that CMS gave in their guide, because they were very nice examples, and populated the benefit name and then I just went through the 837 for any loop and segment that is affected and just kind of did a little mock-up here. So here we have the benefit is additional inpatient days because that's a benefit that sometimes is offered as a supplemental benefit. And of course, the PWK06, this is that dynamic code in the PWK segment is 1A1ZZ because remember it has to have the ZZ and then the 1A1, which is its code. Then the billing provider is the actual NPI of the provider, because you're gonna have that, because it's going to be whatever facility the member was in. The diagnosis code will be the actual diagnosis code that's reported on, on that encounter, the actual revenue code, the actual procedure code, the actual line item charge, and then DA, for the units, because you have the option for different values to put there, you're going to be DA. And then a certain service line value is the count of additional days. And again, if you don't speak 837, that's okay. But your folks that do are going to need to know this, because this is what the quantity is, the count of additional days that were covered and the actual service date. And so you see here where I went and did this for all these benefits. Now, for some of these, you're going to have some defaults. So a good example is worldwide emergency coverage. So this would be the situation where we've got members who are traveling and perhaps they have some sort of an emergency and need to be cared for. There's coverage for that. Their code is 4C1ZZ. Probably won't have an NPI for that provider because if it's in another country, probably don't have one. And so you'd use the default. And notice it's the same default we've always used for professional, right? It ends with 8-4. There is a default diagnosis code, SBSD1. This is kind of, again, what, what is in that default data set that CMS gave to say, this is what's used when you don't have a diagnosis available for this type of coverage. There's a default revenue code, and you can see it's the same revenue code for all these that require default. So it's not a different default that's dependent on the scenario. It's the same default. They made it easy. You can see that they did that here, too, with the diagnosis and with the procedure code just to make it easy. So it's not, you know, going to be SP, SP3, you know, for some for another benefit. It's always going to be SP, SP1. And then the line item charge, you know, depending on the benefit, you know, for worldwide emergency coverage that we're looking at here, it's the actual amount that's being claimed, the actual units that come from the claim, the actual quantity, the actual service date, and so on. So let's take a look at the out the over-the-counter pre-funded card as an example. So this would be where, you know, the member gets a spending card where they can spend it on, you know, over-the-counter items of their choosing. Now the code attributable to that is 13BZZ. It's probably gonna get a default NPI because you can get these, these items, you know, Kroger, or you can get them at Walgreens, you know, wherever. They might probably don't have an NPI so it gets the default NPI. 
And it's also important to remember that at this time, you know, the, the rule still applies if, that, you know, CMS has pretty much said this, the filtering logic hasn't changed. And part of that is where anything that is billed with an atypical provider NPI is not included for risk adjustment. Because I know somebody might be, oh, are these included for risk adjustment um, right now? Filtering logic has not changed, and the presence of the default NPI, of course, disallows it for risk adjustment. So we and, we, and the same with the procedure codes, they, they still have the same crosswalk happening. So if anybody's, you know, asking question about risk adjustment, you know, right now, the filtering logic has not changed. So over-the-counter prefunded card, SBSD1, we have another default, you know, default revenue code default procedure code. And then of course the amount is going to be the amount that's funded on the card. So say it's you they get hundred dollars one one time a month for this. It would be one hundred dollars right here. And then the units one, the quantity one, and the range is the from and to date that's according to the frequency of the funding. So if it's a monthly benefit, it's going to be the range like, you know, 1-1 of 2024 to 131 2024 So if it's annual, it's going to be that that whole year would be the range. Or if it's weekly, you know, whatever the frequency of the funding is. And the service line paid amount is going to be the amount that the enrollee actually used. So out of their $100, if they used $50 of it, this, that's what's going to go there. And it could be they used, you know, $50 one day, you know, they use $75 another or you know, 25 another. You can combine, say they used it, you know, that over-the-counter card for that total amount for the entire month. So that's how a, a pre pre-funded card like that would would go. Now, say they got a situation where it was a combined over-the-counter food and produce so they could use it for all the counter items food things like that you would have one encounter which constitutes the over-the-counter items so your 13 bzz with your atypical provider npi all of your defaults the total amount that's funded on the card so it doesn't necessarily have to be what's allocated to the otc portion it can be the total amount that's funded on the card the range from and through according to the frequency of the funding, and then the amount that the enrollee actually used on the over-the-counter items. Now, again, remember this, you may have to work with your vendor to get this information to help you break this down. So I, I imagine that's gonna be the situation with a lot of folks in the audience. So you'll need to engage your vendors to do this. And this matrix is a good way to help organize what you need to do. Now, the second one might be food and produce. And so this is, 13IZZ with your defaults here, the amount funded on the card, just as we've been seeing, your range from and through, the amount the enrollee actually used that's attributable to the food and the produce. So you're going to have two encounters in this case for a combined over-the-counter and food card. Now, a lot of folks offer physical fitness and gym memberships. It's very similar. This code is 14C4-1ZZ for your PWK06. Has all your defaults because most gyms do not have NPIs. Your line item charge, you meaning your total charge, is going to be the actual cost of the membership for the time period reported. Now, this could be any time period. Usually, it's monthly or annually, depending on the, the arrangement that you have with the, the gym or the vendor but it's the actual cost for that time period. I suspect for a lot of you, it's monthly. So it would be whatever monthly fee there, there is for the gym. The range from and through, again, it could be one month, like 1-1-2024 you know, through 1-31-2024. And then the actual cost of the membership for the time period reported. Another typical situation that comes up is personal emergency response systems. Um, these often require a couple of claims, at least in the beginning, because you might have the claim for the device itself, like the life alert or whatever it is they're using, and the monthly monitoring fee that might be associated with it. So the SBSC code for these is the same at 14C11ZZ with the same defaults. And then the date 
for the actual devices, the actual date of the installation or when they were given the device, when they activated it, and then the actual cost that was paid for it. And then the only difference is with the service date, with the monitoring fee, you have the range being the time period that's being billed. Again, usually on a monthly basis. Could be some other arrangement, but usually monthly. So it has to be broken down into two encounters. Same we have here for combined vision and hearing. Now, it again, it requires, and I didn't break one down here, you know, but it requires a claim for each type of benefit. So you'd have one for vision, one for hearing, and these will have actual NPIs because these providers do have NPIs. They will be providing actual diagnosis codes, actual revenue and procedure codes, if applicable. And then, of course, the amount funded for the benefit for the time period is what gets populated the line item charge. Time period being billed, again, usually monthly, but it could be some other arrangement. And then the amount that the enrollee actually used. And, of course, two benefit, two Two encounters here, one for the vision, one for the hearing. And I just did a couple of other examples here. One's for pest control, because we see that quite a bit. That PWK06 is going to be 13I3ZZ. Default NPI, of course, because pest control companies don't usually have NPIs. I don't know of any that do. And of course, your line item charge is going to be the cost of the benefit for the time period reported. Again, usually monthly, but it could be annually, could be semi-annually, you know, some other arrangement. As you see here. And then, of course, the actual cost is what you're going to put in the service line paid amount. So you see a pattern here. They're looking for um, the code. You know, all this default data, and you're going to see an example of this in an actual 837 in just a minute. You see the amount funded for the benefit versus the amount that the member used. So you see, you know, a theme appearing here. And I had tobacco cessation is another one. That's another popular benefit that's offered. 14C3ZZ is our PWK06. All your default data because your tobacco cessation, you know, doesn't have an MPI either with all the appropriate defaults that never change. Cost of the benefit for the time period reported could be a one-time deal, could be monthly, it just depends on what type of a benefit you're offering. And that will dictate what the range is. And then the actual cost of the benefit. So that's just a sample matrix. You know, it, like I said, whatever you're using doesn't have to be fancy. I would argue the simpler, the better. You know, when you're, you're working with, you know, developers and programmers, you know, they just want the requirements, simpler, the better. So, you know, don't think you have to come up with something elaborate unless you have a template or something that they require you to use. And you may have to adapt it since this is kind of a special, special situation, but it's something to get you started if you, especially if you don't have any requirements templates that you're working on for development purposes. So what I did here. For those, this is going to be interesting, especially for those of you who've never seen an 837. This is what one looks like. Um, and so what I did was I, I kind of mocked up an 837 here for a food benefit. And so what you'll want to do when you're doing your test cases, so say when you, you have your matrix and you have 50 different benefits that you're offering in your package that correspond with your bid and what you're offering. And so you'll want to be sure that you have a mocked up 837 for each of these so that when you do your internal testing and when you do your testing with tier two, you've got an actual 837 that you know is going to pass all of the many edits that CMS has. And then you can specifically test and make sure that all the changes that you've made cause your encounters to pass. So here in red, I highlighted what what is different about this from a standard, you know, regular encounter or even a chart review. So here you see we have Food City. This is because somebody went to go get food, probably using a pre-funded card. And here you see that default NPI, the one nine 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 eight four is your default. And then you see all of this is probably for a lot of you, it's like, oh my goodness, look at all that. It's basically identifying the member, their demographic information, their date of birth, their gender. It identifies that CMS is the receiver of the encounter, um, the claim ID, 
the total build amount, the place of service, you know, all the things that an 837 requires. And then here is that default diagnosis code, SBSD1. And then these are qualifiers that say, hey, I'm a diagnosis code in this segment. Then we come down, we've got member information, various other requirements of the 837. And then this here you see is our default procedure code, that SBSP1, the amount that was funded on the card, and then units is one. Again, these are all standard defaults. Here's our PWK segment. So here's our new friend, PWK, at the line level, because here's, here's our line level. It says, and here's our three static values, the IR, EM, and AC for the one and two and three. And then the six is 13I1ZZ. And I don't have enough asterisks here. So those of you who speak 837, yes, there should be more asterisks here to account for the, the data elements in that segment that are not used. But the important one here is the six, and that says, hey, I'm a benefit for food. Your date in this one is a month because apparently they are fund. We'll say they're a, they're funded one hundred dollars and fifty cents per month. And then this line it says they spent one hundred dollars and fifty cents on this benefit. So that's kind of what a mocked up eight thirty seven would look like. And now I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to go back to our presentation. where we're going to bring it down the home stretch. Okay, so with every change we know comes new and updated edits, always edits. And these should be the basis for your testing for each use case. And as I mentioned earlier, use the tier two environment to test these use cases before production because you don't want to turn on production with no testing and then everything fails and you and your data is incomplete and inaccurate and then you're getting calls from CMS and you know that would not be good. So use the tier two environment. Now, generally, the way that they structured these edits is when there is a PWK segment with the three static values that indicate that this is a supplemental benefit submission as opposed to a chart review or, or a regular encounter, they're checking to make sure that the data service is not before 1-1 one, one of 2024, right? Because that's when this all starts. And future dates are not accepted. Encounters should be held until after the through date. So that, and that's kind of, um, I imagine is going to cause, cause a bit of confusion and consternation because they don't want you sending a claim for the benefit before it's been fully provided. So that's why they say this, they should be held until after the through date. Can't be a chart review record. And we know that the PWK segment has certain values that indicate it is a chart review. So I'll be checking for that. Also, the SBSC codes have to be valid according to Appendix B, and that includes the ZZ appendage. So don't just put the code there and forget the ZZ. It has to have that full, full value. And also, checking to make sure the service line contains the supplemental benefit default diagnosis and procedure code and revenue code, you know, but doesn't have that PWK segment. Also, they had a number of edits that they had to update because of the need for bypass conditions. So if you employ these validations internally, like say you're a vendor listening to this, or even a health plan that does this, and you're doing this type of editing, you want to be sure that you account for these so that you avoid possible rejections. Um, I was joking yesterday as we were in our test session, like, man, I would have hated to have been the person at CMS having to test all this. Because that's a lot of edits. We have a lot of edits. But they have listed here the ones that you'll need to update, you know, if you are, if you have these to indicate bypass conditions, and then the new ones. So be sure that you're testing, and that's going to be your test. Your true test when you're doing your tier two testing is, is it failing because of these edits? And if it is, you need to go back and tweak your logic. All right. So I'm going to say a few words about operational reporting. <clears throat> and so you can be assured, of course, that CMS is going to be developing reporting that is very specific to these benefits. And they've already indicated they're going to be comparing what they see in these submissions to the bid, among other things. They will also likely be, sub be monitoring what comes in the SBC of other, you know, not because they want to like be punitive or anything, but they need to see that, you know, is there something maybe they didn't account for? Um, and also they want to make sure that those are lump sum or pre-funded arrangements are broken down into the components correctly. So 
some of the operational reporting, of course, this is not exhaustive, but this is just something to get you started and to kind of get you thinking about the type of reporting that's going to be needed to make sure these submissions are complete and accurate. You want to run a query at least quarterly to pull in all encounters sent with the PWK 01, 02, and 03 static values. So that's just going to pull back everything that's supplemental. That way you're not pulling chart reviews, you're not pulling regular encounters, just your supplemental benefits. Cross-reference these to your matrix to group by benefit, and then compare these to what is specified in the bid, and then you should investigate any outliers. And then, of course, I included you know, some data elements that you'll want to be sure to pull into the query to make it meaningful to whoever's looking at it. Now, taking it a little further, you know, we want to look at some other things that we're moving now towards the outcomes aspect of this, because this is really what this data is going to be used for, looking at outcomes, looking at utilization. You know, how are these needs being anticipated before the member ever steps foot in an office? Has there been appropriate screening for needs that can be served by these benefits? Is the need for the service clearly documented in the medical record? and represented by a corresponding diagnosis code. And for referrals, was the loop closed, meaning did the member receive the product or service? And how and how often is this measured and by whom? That's really important to know. And then, you know, how are these encounters being tied to outcomes? And that's going to be a little bit trickier to look at, you know, but a lot of you out there that work in risk and quality and gap closure, you know, probably are already kind of seeing some of the things that you're going to want to be looking at when it comes to outcomes. And so just to give a few examples of this, like for vision is a good example. Does the utilization of these benefits result in fewer falls and car accidents or accidents in general for your dental? You know, does the utilization of these benefits result in fewer diagnoses with ICD-10 codes between K00 and K088, dental related maladies for hearing? Does the utilization of these benefits result in reduced prevalence of mental health diagnoses or reports of isolation and loneliness? Just as an example. And for food and nutrition, does the utilization of these benefits result in better diabetes or hypertension control? Are there fewer, are there reported reductions in BMI or fewer diagnoses of morbid obesity? Fewer diagnoses of malnutrition or specific nutritional deficiencies? List goes on and on. So just a few things just to kind of get you started thinking about what types of outcomes you might want to be looking at that are associated with these benefits. So in summary, as we bring this to a close and do a little bit of Q&A, I wanted to leave you with an implementation punch list. And so this is just kind of like your down and dirty, you know, checklist of things that you have to do in order to be sure that you're ready to operationalize this and turn on the switch. And that is creating your benefits matrix for use cases and requirements for the technical team, creating your X12-837 mappings for each use case. And this is going to require developers to do more than likely. And they probably reside in your claims department or where whoever is doing that type of technical work for your encounter. So your encounter data technical team. Also, they are probably involved in creating and adjusting any MAO2 level validations that you might be doing. Performing that tier two testing with your test X12837s for each use case that you have on your matrix. Getting ready for your X12837D submission for dental, which could involve working with a dental vendor or whoever is producing those, going to be producing those dental files. Run your reporting for bid comparison and utilization, you know, getting that teed up and ready to go. And then last but not least, Start thinking about tying this data to outcomes, especially those related to health equity and quality measures. And so I'm going to open it up to some Q&A here. I'm going to take a look at the chat, but I wanted to be sure that you have um, the CMS um, email address if you need any help from them regarding their technical guidance. You know, they're, like I said, they are always a really good resource, very happy to share and help. And they want you to use the risk adjustment operations at cms.hhs.gov. The subject line should be supplemental benefits submission so that they know that's what you have a question about and they can get right on that. And then my information is here. 
And so if you would like to have a copy of the Excel spreadsheet that I reviewed that has the kind of a sample matrix and a sample A37, reach out to me either through my LinkedIn or in my email, and I will send that to you. But you'll get the slide deck, you know, Rise will provide that to you. But if you want the spreadsheet, get in contact with me and I will be happy to send that to you. And so let's take a look at the chat. We've got, all right. Are we expecting the ZZ on the end of all PWK06 values for supplemental benefits? Um, yes. It is my interpretation of the guidance to only populate the ZZ on combined supplemental benefits. So my take was that it's on all of it. We can certainly re-examine the evidence, and I can get back to you if my, if my interpretation is still different. But it was mine that they expect that on all of it. And certainly if anybody out there is from CMS or knows the answer to that question, certainly chime in. Will this discussion be posted online? Yes, um, RISE will uh, publish the recording for this. And she said, Gretchen says, yes, recording will be posted. Um, do we have any other questions? I know we are we are almost at time. We've just got a few minutes. Okay, good question. If we already submitted encounters for some of these benefits in our current process, but without the code, is CMS expecting to see these encounters again with the codes? My understanding is no. Um, they did address in their guidance, like some, we, like for example, we have a client who provides um, gym memberships, they provide, you know, the food and nutrition, and they've actually been submitting this data. Um, but my understanding is it doesn't have to be resubmitted, although you want to change the way it's being submitted. So gym membership is a good one. So say, you know, up until now, you've been submitting that um, with a with your own set of proprietary codes. You want to change that to reflect what CMS requires. And they want you want to do that, quote unquote, as soon as possible, because CMS hasn't said, oh, you need to do it as of June. They want, you know, as soon as you can change it to the new set of codes. But they don't want you to go back and resubmit everything as adjustments. You know, just going forward, submit it with a new set of codes. Great question. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to Bailey from RISE. I want to thank everybody for joining me today. I hope this was informative and helped break down, you know, something that, you know, can be a re really hard to, to digest. But, you know, the key to eating the elephant is, is one bite at a time. And of course, I am here as a resource um, and a guide. If you need me, please reach out. If you're if you're struggling, just have some questions. You know, I, I have an open door policy and reach out to CMS. They too would be happy to answer questions that people have. Back to you, Bailey. Awesome. Thank you, Don. And thank you, um, everyone, for attending on behalf of RISE and Centauri Health Solutions. Um, before we officially close out today's webinar, um, I am just going to go ahead and post our webinar experience survey. If you could just take a couple seconds to complete that, let us know how we've done.